All right, so picking up with flashcard number 10, number 10 says the impact of presidential appointments on precedent. So obviously precedent is not something that can't be overturned as we've discussed. And presidents will uh, make appointments that match their judicial philosophy and, and, and beliefs. And sometimes they'll, they'll make judges with the intention of overturning precedent. And we see this in, um, for example, the 2016 election, uh, when there was a vacancy on the Supreme Court and people thought there would be uh, future openings, which there certainly were uh, during the presidency of Donald Trump, he said when he was running for office, I will appoint judges that will overturn Roe versus Wade, that will overturn the federal constitutional protection of uh, abortion rights. Uh, that has yet to occur. He has appointed justices that he think will do this in the long, in the long run. And certainly time will tell. But presidential appointments do impact precedent. They either solidify it or they overturn it and they change it. So that's, that's you know, judges are appointed by the president and they're confirmed by the Senate, as we've discussed in previous units. So they have a significant, presidents have a significant role in the power of the judiciary. Now, <clears throat> who they appoint, they obviously look at their judicial philosophy. Now, uh, an activist judge, judicial activism is the idea of using the court's power broadly um, and typically this, this power, this usage of the court's power, um, activist judges will, will say, um, or people who study them will say that they're using it to try to further social justice, to expand issues of um, equality, uh, of liberty, of personal individual rights, um, as well as equal protection rights under the Constitution. They want to use the court's power to strike down laws that they feel are unconstitutional um, or they feel that inhibit um, you know, those, those goals. Now, someone who believes in judicial restraint certainly doesn't uh, mean that they don't believe in individual rights or liberty or equality, but they're more hesitant to use the courts as the vehicle for that because they're not as democratic. You know, someone who exercises judicial restraint will be less likely to interfere in the actions of other branches of government um, <clears throat> because they think that that's where the power um, of the people resides. So um, they'll be more restrained in their decision making. So it's really a, a question about what role you view the court um, as having, whether you believe you should be activist and involved or more restrained and let the other more elected branches, particularly the legislative branches, at both the state and the federal level, uh, make the decisions. Now, <clears throat> Congress can certainly pass laws if they don't like decisions that the Supreme Court is making. They can certainly pass laws to try to um, kind of work around um, the provisions of, of, of a Supreme Court decision. If the court is, make, is making a ruling on a specific phraseology or wording of a law, you know, Congress can try to find a different way to phrase it or a different legal avenue to justify it. But this only goes so far. So the main way that Congress could override a, um, a, a Supreme Court decision is through their role in the constitutional amendment process. Obviously, Congress is not the only part of the constitutional amendment process. We know that the states also play a role in that, something that we need to keep in mind. We remember that Congress has to propose an amendment, both houses, two-thirds vote, uh, and then three quarters of the state legislatures to confirm. But that certainly, if the Supreme Court makes a, you know, to, as an example, um, the Supreme Court ruled that uh, flag burning was constitutionally protected under the First Amendment as free speech. Um, and there was a big movement to, uh, to amend the Constitution as a response to that. It was, you know, politicians were asked, do you support a um, anti-flag burning amendment, which would have, which would have been, then changed the Constitution. So if the Supreme Court says it's constitutionally protected, and then the Constitution is changed to say it's not, it's no longer constitutionally protected. So they've gone around and overrode the Supreme Court. But we know how hard it is to, to change the Constitution so, uh, and how infrequently it happens. So that, that's the Supreme Court's, um, excuse me, Congress's ultimate mechanism to override the Supreme Court. Now, the confirmation and appointment process, uh, or appointment and confirmation process, we know, again, the president appoints a Supreme Court justice. Uh, we've talked about, you know, how presidents will appoint justices who agree with their um, philosophical uh, viewpoints, whether they're activists or restraint judges. And along with those, we go with strict constructionist or loose constructionist. A strict constructionist, someone who um, um, believes the Constitution should be interpreted very narrowly. You know, it means kind of, you know, just it means what it uh, what it says, and, and you can't go beyond that. And, and a loose constructionist would say, uh, well, you can interpret things widely, right to privacy is in the Constitution, even though it's not listed in the Constitution. As an example, we'll talk about that in our Civil Liberties Unit. 
So the Supreme Court, uh, so the president appoints a justice and then the Senate has to advise and consent. So the way this process works now is a Senate Judiciary Committee, which committee? They'll, uh, they'll hold basically hearings where they'll, they'll call the uh, nominee uh, before the committee and they'll ask them questions about their philosophy, about their experience. And in the modern era, you know, this we've talked about in class, this can be, um, this can be contentious depending on the justice. And, you know, certainly we have the examples we discussed of Robert Bork uh, with the Reagan administration, of Clarence Thomas, George H.W. Bush's appointee who did get confirmed, uh, Brett Kavanaugh with Trump's appointment with the accusations that were leveled against him. Um, you know, these things can get pretty messy. Um, you know, sometimes they get less attention and they can be less controversial. But uh, the Supreme Court does have hearings. Excuse me. The Senate does have hearings. They'll vote uh, as a committee to recommend or not recommend um, the justice. And then they'll they'll schedule a vote as the whole Senate. And the Senate needs to then vote to, to confirm. Um, it used to be that justices could be filibustered. But the Senate has changed their rules to say that Supreme Court justices uh, or any federal justices now can no longer be filibustered. So they simply need a majority vote um, to be confirmed. Now, uh, the Congress can change the court's appellate jurisdiction. Okay? Because Article 3, we talked about this earlier in one of our videos, Article 3 says that um, the, the appellate jurisdiction is basically established by Congress. So if Congress doesn't like the court, they like what the court is doing, they can limit what types of appeals they can hear. That's, that's something that doesn't really happen, but um, it's certainly a power Congress does have. So there are checks on the judiciary, the checks um, um, on the president's appointment power and who can be in the judiciary, there's checks on um, uh, you know, Congress trying to limit with the constitutional amendment process or changing laws or changing the court's jurisdiction. Um, a few other vocabulary terms we'll just kind of run through here. Uh, criminal law versus civil law. Um, you know, criminal law is when it's a, a, the, the government versus uh, a, a, you know, someone who's committed a crime. And a civil law is when it's between two people. So the penalty for a criminal law is someone potentially go to prison. Um, and the penalty for a civil law is usually financial. So somebody's suing someone else who's being harmed. Um, <clears throat> when we talk about how the court functions, court briefs, okay, that most of the uh, arguments will be written down by the lawyers for both sides in, in written briefs, um, and uh, they'll be submitted to the court. But also anybody can write what's called a friend of the court brief, an amicus curiae brief, in which they can also kind of step in and say, well, I, I, I'm interested in this particular issue. Uh, you know, if it's an affirmative action case, for example, we've had a number of those recently, maybe a, a college or university that's not involved in the case, but has affirmative action policies of their own. Maybe they'll write a legal brief and submit it to the court and say, well, consider these arguments as well. Senatorial courtesy is the idea that uh, when there are vacancies in uh, the, the, the court system, you know, district courts, appellate courts, then um, the president will, will uh, ask the, the senators from those districts, those states where the districts are, of his own party only, if there's no senator from his own party, he won't ask, um, ask them to kind of uh, make recommendations for, um, for those seats. So the Senate can play a role as well. It's not a constitutional uh, requirement at all. It's kind of, again, a courtesy. Um, the rule of four, the idea that uh, for the justices to decide to hear a case, four of them uh, need to say they want to hear it. So if most appeals to the Supreme Court are denied. We've talked about that in earlier videos. If four justices decide they want to hear a case, they can grant the appeal. And if they grant the appeal, they issue what's called a writ of certiorari. That's an order to lower courts to send up the records of, uh, of a case. Um, you know, cert is granted. There's an appeal. There's an application for it. And then they'll issue an order. Say, OK, we're going to hear the case. We're issuing a writ. Send up uh, all of the all of the materials and we'll take a look at the briefs and then we'll schedule oral arguments. And this is where the Supreme Court will have the lawyers from both sides um, and, and they'll uh, they'll make their arguments and they'll question. And these are recorded and you can listen to them, but they're recorded in audio only, not in video. Uh, clerks. I don't know if we touched on this, but, you know, certainly the Supreme Court has um, usually recent law school grads, uh, quote unquote, the, the best and brightest. You know, the, the, this is a job that um, if you work as a clerk in the Supreme Court, you help them write opinions, you help them do research. Um, and multiple of the justices on the court now actually served as courts uh, clerks for previous justices. So um, that's a pretty significant position. Um, when a, a um, case is heard, then opinions will be issued. You'll have your majority opinion uh, that will, you know, this, the court has issued a ruling. The majority opinion will 
um, give the legal arguments for w what the decision was that the court made, but there can be dissents. If there are dissents, someone will write a dissenting opinion. You can have one majority and one dissent, and that's it, but you can also have what are known as concurring opinion, where maybe a lawyer, uh, excuse me, a, a judge will join with the majority, but you know, give a different legal argument or join with the dissent and say something else about their disagreements. And so the legal opinions are really important for laying out the guiding principles for why the court made the decisions that they made in these cases. And then finally, I already talked about strict constructionist and loose constructionist, um, but this is, goes back to judicial philosophy. If you're a strict constructionist, you believe in a narrow interpretation of the literal text of the Constitution. We also use the phrase originalist to go along with strict constructionism. And then loose constructionists, they, uh, they will interpret the Constitution more loosely. Okay? They'll use the word equality, for example, in the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. And they'll say, well, that applies to the LGBTQ community, even though when it was written in the 1800s, it was really uh, written with um, newly freed slaves and African Americans in mind. So they'll say, well, we can apply it to the modern era. And strict constructionists will say, well, what did it mean when it was written? That's more of an originalist point of view. So here are uh, all of your 25 flashcards. I hope this video was helpful. Uh, again, I always say this, my disclaimer, it's a rapid fire review. This is, does not cover everything we covered in class or in your reading or that you're responsible for but it points you in the right direction, hopefully. Thanks for watching and have a great day.